Um, also, feel free if I don't, if you don't hear the recording in progress, feel free to uh, check me on that because I will do that and catch myself five minutes in um, or an hour and 50 minutes into the lecture. Um, so, and I, I hate doing that. You know, people rely on having those recordings. Once you know that they're going to be there, I try to make sure that they're going to be there for you. Uh, so, many apologies about Tuesday. Um, so, I promised we'd go over some biochem questions, random questions. Um, I actually don't know hardly anything about the biochemistry of fungi, other than I know that fungi are more closely related to mammals than they are to plants, which is weird. Um, but in terms of molecular processes, that's that's what I've heard in terms of genetically. Um, fungi, that's why they're their own branch on, on the tree of life, their own you know, kingdom, is because it's they're so different than plants and bacteria. Um, so, and I don't know a whole lot about the motor proteins of um, fungi in particular, but this is the sort of question that you get to answer if you take an upper division biochem class. You start getting to learn about what are some of the molecular processes, what's the chemistry behind some of the molecular processes. And sure, you wind up, you know, having to do a lot of memorizing, um, but it's still some pretty cool stuff that, you know, my, at least for my upper division biochem class, we basically, you know, in the first, we had to memorize all the structures of all the 20 amino acids that show up on, in life on Earth, which isn't that hard once you've taken OCHEM. Um, but then you also had to memorize, we had to memorize the structures and the mechanisms for the entire, for glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain, which is a lot of different chemicals and a lot of different processes. So that was, that took a little bit. Um, to memorize. So it is a lot of memorizing, but it also it's really, really cool in that you start actually getting to understand. Uh, I remember how mind blowing it was for me when I learned that when I actually processed that ATP synthase is effectively um, a water wheel. It literally physically changes configuration based on protons moving through, through the cell membrane. And when they do that, it physically changes the configuration of the protein in a way that literally forces a phosphate and an ADP together to make ATP. Um, and so the idea that we're making chemicals by making physical changes at the enzyme level was you know, really, really cool to me. I wound up taking a lot of um, molecular bio units that I didn't need to use because I thought it was cool. So if you're interested in stuff like that, um, then take more biochem classes. Uh, and you'll learn more. In general, motor proteins work by by allowing, they typically have two different pieces. Um, so I know the ones for, for humans are actin and myosin, and basically myosin is like this little, this long stretched out protein that has sort of these like rungs, almost like a ladder. Um, and they're, they're chemical rungs where, they, where there's like a little functional group on the end of each of these. And actin is a protein that basically can work like it, like a, an inchworm. When you spend an ATP, um, it ex it extends this front leg to the next one, and then when it releases the ATP, it brings this piece forward. So it literally kind of works like a molecular inchworm. Um, and so that's that's how your muscles work, and that's why they only all your muscles do is contract. The way that they're set up, your muscles pull so that basically if this is attached to some big piece over here and this is stationary, you're pulling this whole piece along with it when it does its molecular inchworm thing. Um, and so understanding it at the molecular level, some of that stuff is, like I said, um, I like to geek out on it. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's take more biochem classes and you get to learn a lot of that. I would guarantee you at a bigger at a bigger school when you get if you get to an upper division class if you're a biochem major you get a chance to take biochemistry of fungus, um, and because it's going to be its own animal it's going to be its own they they don't use the electron they only use their eukaryotes they use the electron transport chain but a lot of these other systems are going to be different like in in the standard biochem class we spent the whole probably two weeks on just on how hemoglobin works. It's a really well understood um, molecule that has really 
important functions, but also is really well studied. Um, and so, but that wouldn't apply to fungi. Fungi are gonna have their own systems, right? And so somebody has gone to the trouble of learning how fungi do oxygen transport from the outside to the inside. And so you get to learn about that process and how it's different. Um, one of the other cool things to you know that, so mo all mammals, most animals, uh, where does that tree branch off? Um, mo all mammals, but most things besides crustaceans and deep sea fish use similar molecules to hemoglobin and myoglobin for oxygen transport. Um, but crustaceans have a different color blood because they don't use iron-based oxygen transport. They use, I think it's copper-based. So their blood is literally blue. Um, and there's some fish, some deep sea creatures um, that have something similar that might be based around manganese. It's some other, some other transition metal similar to iron and copper in that same area that they use as their as the ion for their oxygen transport. Is that because they like predate the great oxygen oxygenization? Oxygen so oxygen oxygenization. Oxygenization. Yeah. yeah. That's the word. They might. Um, it might be that, and it might just be that they just took a different fork. Yeah. Um, so if if our species, if our branch of the tree of life evolved away from that branch before oxygen became commonly available, or it might just be because they have different needs, being at really deep levels, they might need to have different binding affinities to oxygen than than things that live at the surface level where we have plenty of oxygen available to breathe. Um, but I don't really know for sure. Evolutionary biology is also a whole different field that you can go into from biochemistry where you can answer questions like that. What's the history that we're, evolutionary biology is really cool because you get to tie together paleontology. If you're anything like me, then from when you, you know, first learned what a dinosaur was up until you um, saw Jurassic Park, you wanted to be a paleontologist and probably put past post Jurassic Park. Um, and evolutionary biology gets to tie the biochem and the genetics to the paleontology and look at stuff like where species diverged and things like that. Um, really fun field. Um, I'll go the shorter answer to what causes chemical burns because it's faster. Basically the same thing that causes regular burns. You denature the proteins in your skin. You can denature the proteins in your skin by applying heat. And basically denaturing proteins just means you cause them to misfold which also typically disrupts the cell membranes and kills the cells as well. Um, so you cause cell death and a bunch of all the structural proteins around wind up falling apart when you apply extreme heat or extreme cold, or if you change the pH too much, or if you apply you know, oxidizing agents or reducing agents that are really strong. All of these, all the, the chemical environment is really, really critical for making sure your, your enzymes all fold properly. You disrupt any of that, um, then your cells start to fall apart, literally. And your body's system for dealing with that is to start rebuilding skin cells as fast as it can, which a lot of times looks like a blister. Um, a blister is basically like a shield that, that covers over an area so that your body can make um, new skin cells as fast as possible, um, which is why you should never pop a blister while it still has fluid in it because it's serving a function by doing that. It's a pain to keep it that way, but it'll actually heal a lot faster if you let your body do its thing um, in general. Then again, don't take medical advice from me because I'm not a trained medical professional. So your mileage may vary. Um, do, uh, do acids like break apart the hydrogen bonds? Yeah, it's exactly what they do. You end up protonating certain functional groups in the enzymes, which cause them to not be stay stuck together. So if you had something like a what's the like let's say you got like sun blisters like what are those blisters filled with then it's basically just a, a whole bunch of Bio yeah biomass biomaterial that's really useful for transporting um you know nutrients to the growing skin cells and to protect them while they're developing um i'm sorry what was your question it was like a like all oh, the pH, yeah. So basically, if you've got a big, big old um, twisted up protein that looks like this, it's just one big long chain of amino acids that fold a certain way. 
Each of those amino acids has little functional groups like an OH here or an NH2 over here. Um, and those NH2s, they have a lone pair, right? If that lone pair is serving a really important function for keeping this folded a certain way so that it's right next to, um, I don't know, an oxygen and a hydrogen, if hope having that OH group pointed so that the hydrogen is pointed towards the lone pair on the nitrogen, if that's really important for keeping this whole big mess folded properly, all of a sudden protonating that nitrogen means that you're not going to have a favorable interaction anymore in the same way, which is going to change the shape of the entire protein. And if this happens to be an important protein for the cell to survive, like it's involved in the electron transport chain or it's important for... Yeah, maybe it's um it's a water pump for keeping the right pressure inside the cell compared to outside the cell or something like that. You can wind up with a cell die if you denature these proteins. And so that's all a chemical burn really is, is you're using chemicals to denature the proteins instead of just using heat. Um, we're just more used to heat as a burn because we deal with heat on every basis and we don't deal with extreme acids and bases that often. So if you pull your hand away really quick, you have like a chance of not. Yeah, it's it's like anything else. It's it's going to be based on how long, and that's why you can wind up burning yourself more severely with a lower temperature if you do something like I'm I'm a real bonehead when I'm cooking on the grill and we have a, a grill basket that we can't cook vegetables in. And I one time I opened it up and it looked cold, so I grabbed it with both hands. That hurt a whole lot less or a whole lot more than when I just brushed my hand against the cookie sheet in the oven. Even though the cookie sheet was was hotter, I didn't physically grab it and hold on to it for as long. Don't do. I don't recommend doing that. That would be hurt for a while on both hands. Um, we'll talk about AI another time. Um, we'll talk some relevant quiz quiz questions. Um, I saw this one twice. Also, what is the difference between molar solubility and molarity? Molar molarity is the unit. It's just how many moles there are per liter, right? Molar solubility is, is a molarity. It's just the maximum molarity you can have in water of a certain compound. So molarity is the unit we use to describe molar solubility. Molar solubility is like the upper end, just like the molar solubility like speed limit versus speed is kind of what this question is asking. Speed limit might be 65 miles per hour, but your speed can be anything from zero to 65. <laughs> realistically more than that but like for the sake of this analogy assume you're not going to speed right they're they're related but they're kind of just, you know it's it's two different things that you're talking about um and then last but not least what are the situations where diatomic elements aren't diatomic basically if you give enough energy that you can break those bonds so remember Does this shape look familiar? We have this kind of graph. This was energy. This is like the distance between two atoms. If you bring two atoms together, there's some theoretical distance where your lowest possible energy state. And that's the, the average bond length for those two atoms. And that happens when you get the, the maximum overlap of the orbitals between the two atoms. So that's when you get the strongest covalent bond is when you can get them at just the right distance so that you know your, your um, electrons from atom A and your electrons from atom B can both be in the same space and be in the same orbital at the same time, it has a sort of a, an ideal distance that's gonna be different for every pair of atoms. Well, if you put enough energy into this system that you can take those electrons and move them up to, to this you know, uh, limit here, basically give, put in enough energy to the system that the covalent bond won't hold things together anymore. You have a, a non-zero chance of your two atoms just flying apart at that point and breaking the energy or breaking the bond apart. So if you take diatomic elements and you just put them in a case in a situation where you can, where they have lots of energy, either by shining light on them or just heating them up, then you wind up with the, their bonds just sort of falling apart and you get the free atoms floating around, which in the way we distinguish that is if we had, 
know, two fluorines, F2, we just call that fluorine, right? Um, if you have a fluorine by itself as a free radical, meaning with an unpaired electron, we actually specify and call that atomic fluorine. So atomic fluorine is what you get when you shine the right wavelength of light on diatomic fluorine. And you wind up with that promoting those electrons to the higher energy level and the whole thing falls apart. This is really, really unstable though. And so it's immediately gonna find something else it can react with and form a new covalent bond with. And if it's all other fluorines around, it's just gonna make another F2 molecule again as soon as you remove that extra heat. Um, interesting, yeah, there's actually a phase where not only do you don't you do you not have covalent bonds because everything has so much energy, if you get to a high enough energy state, it's another good review one. It's why it's worth spending the time on. Back to PV diagrams. What's up here? Supercritical fluid. So this is solid liquid gas. Supercritical fluid happens above the critical point because you have enough, your molecules have enough energy to be a gas, but they don't have enough space to be a gas. The other thing that can happen here is you can wind up making what, if you take this to an extreme, you can wind up with a case called a plasma, which sometimes gets used interchangeably with supercritical fluid because all plasmas are supercritical fluids, but not all supercritical fluids are plasmas. Um, a plasma means that you have so much energy and everything is so densely packed together that you, your electrons are no longer bound to the nuclei anymore. Your electrons are freely dissociating from the atoms. They're just sort of flying around on their own. So you have to actually have like a suit of electrons flying around and nuclei floating around together. Um, and so that's really sort of like the extreme case of what we were just talking about. It's <laughs> such conditions that you get really, really high energy states. Um, then you wind up making a plasma, which is what's happening in the sun. You can actually, and that's why the center of the sun doesn't have covalent bonds or even ionic bonds because everything is so hot, but also under such pressure that electrons are just freely dissociated. And if you want a good explanation of that, um, it actually helped me understand what a plasma was a lot better. Does anybody know the band? There might be they might be giants. They have um, they had a couple of novelty hits in the in the late '80s, early '90s, like Istanbul, not Constantinople, and Birdhouse of Your Soul. They also did the theme song from Malcolm in the Middle. Um, the uh, they also have a couple of kids albums where they actually write. Yeah, um, songs about math and English and science. Their album, Here Comes Science, has a song called The Sun is a Massive Incandescent Gas. Gigantic nuclear furnace. Exactly. Um, except that all the physicists, and there are a lot of physicists who are fans of They Might Be Giants for some reason, um, wrote in to them and say, well, it's not really a gas, it's a plasma. So they released a follow-up song called The Sun is a Miasma of Incandescent Plasma. Um, and those two songs together, Sun is a Massive Incandescent Gas is really, really good um, on its own. It's really catchy. And then they actually released the follow up, which is, you know, big of them, really fun. Maybe a brain will want to listen to those. Um, anyway, that is one more case where diatomic atoms will not be diatomic in <laughs> the center of the sun. All right, so let's try and do some redox chemistry now. Um, let's say this is a reaction that's been known to happen. You have potassium permanganate, and does anybody remember what C2O4 with the negative two charge is? Um, it might, was that up, not on your list of polyatomics you had to memorize? Check it out. It is oxalate, yeah. Um, so if that's not ringing any bells, then it probably wasn't on your list. It was there. Just in the um, bottom lake in corner. If you protonate that twice, you get oxalic acid, which does play a role in biochemistry. Oxalate is, is relevant in biochemically. Um, so, but permanganate and oxalate will react together. 
um, to form manganese 2 and CO2. How do we balance this reaction? Okay, so how's that going to work? Well, we know oxygen on the permanganate, it's um, like two minus times four. Right, so if we, yeah, we can do the oxidation states and we can, we can figure out what's being oxidized, what's being reduced. Um, that's, there's four of them and they are all minus two, so the manganese has to be what? Eight, seven. Oh, not quite eight because we still are gonna wind up with that negative one overall. So plus seven, and then so manganese is going from plus seven to plus two. Nice thing about ions by themselves is it's really easy to do the oxidation state, right? So manganese is going from plus seven to plus two, which makes that a oxidation or reduction. Uh, oxidation. Mm -hmm. We also have your loss of electrons. It gains, it gains, it gains electrons. electrons. So, uh, so reduction. Yeah. All right. So then, what's being oxidized? It's not the oxygen. The C. No, it's in both of these cases, the ox or in both of these on um, so the minus two and minus two, right? Wait. Carbon got an oxidation state of plus four with CO2. And over here. Guys, four times minus two is minus eight, and we need to add up to a charge of minus two. Three. So there's two of them, and each of them are plus three. So carbon is going from plus three to plus four, which makes that oxidation. That's all great practice. Very useful review for where we're going today. Is the reaction balanced though? Mm -hmm. How do we balance it? Sorry, right, adding coefficients. You said the charges on both sides have to be the same, like we have them. Generally, the charges on both sides have to be the same. It's a balanced reaction, the charges will be the same on both sides. Anybody see a problem with that? Is there any way we can make a bunch of negative charges equal a positive charge? <laughs> Basically, this is it's impossible to balance this as it's written, right? If for no other reason than over here we have carbon and oxygen in a two to one ratio, carbon and oxygen in a two to one ratio, and then we also have extra oxygens. We can't and we can't just add more CO2s. To account for the extra oxygens because we're also adding more carbons when we do that right there's no possible way to balance this as it's written which means there must be other things happen so we're going this is actually not an uncommon state where you know something's happened you know something's being oxidized and something's being reduced you know what, what the primary products and, and reactions are but there must be other stuff happening as well how do we figure out how to balance that? Well, we start looking at what else must be around and we start adding it to both sides until we get it balanced. Um, and so this is what's called the half reaction method. The half reaction method basically means you take out your oxidation and your reduction reactions and you write them out separately. I know I've got, I've got MnO4 minus, reacting to make Mn2 plus. That was our, our reduction, right? Then I know I have C2O4 to minus reacting to make CO2. There's our oxidation. 
We're going to balance each of these separately, and then we're going to add them together. All right, and so we have it set. We basically have a list of things that are almost always present. Most of these redox reactions are going to be happening in um, aqueous environments. And so if we have aqueous environments, we have a couple other pieces floating around that we know we can always use to help balance things. If we're in an aqueous environment, what else do we have around? Waters. If we look at this top one, we know we have to have more oxygen somewhere, right? And if we know we have waters around, we're just going to add waters on either side to make it our, our oxygens balance out. So in this case, That means we've got to add four waters as a product, right? That doesn't change anything about the oxidate or the uh, reduction. That's just saying, well, the oxygens had to go somewhere, and we're doing this in an aqueous environment, so let's just say they turned into waters. What's the problem with that, though? There's no, there's nothing on the reactant. Well, not water specifically. No There's no hydrogen on the reactant side. So if we're in aqueous environments, we don't just have water around, right? What is water doing when it's pure water? Um, it ionizes to make what? Hydroxides and hydroxides and hydroniums. Although we usually use the simplified version here and just call it a, a proton. We know that there's protons around too, right? small concentrations, but they're there. So we just, we kind of just go back and forth, adding other molecules we know are around until we get to something that's balanced. So we need to add like eight, okay. There you go. Go back to what you said a second ago, Edward, about the charges. Oh yeah, so it's like the products and reactants have to have together. So products and reactants have to be, the charges have to be the same too, right? Or else, even if the atoms are balanced, the electrons aren't, right? If the atoms are all balanced, but the charges don't match up, that in, at this point, our atoms are balanced, right? But we have everything adding up to a plus two charge over here, and everything adding up to a... Uh, plus eight and a minus one, so plus seven over here. Right? So what's not balanced? If, if the atoms of the nuclei are all balanced, but the charges aren't, what do we still have to balance? With charges, but with what? Electrons. Electrons are changing hands, right? And so if the electrons are changing hands, then that means the electrons are either going to be a product or a reactant if we have it se separated into our half reactions here. So if the last thing we're going to use to balance charges by adding electrons to one side or the other to make the charges the same, because we can add electrons without throwing off any of the stuff we already balanced, right? So which side and how many electrons do we need? Two. Right, on the right side. I don't know. Well, if we added two electrons to the right hand side, then this would all add up to bond to zero. But that would still not be zero, right? This one is seven plus seven, and that's plus two. Now it's balanced. We kind of broke some rules by just Seems like we just made some stuff up along the way, right? But we didn't we didn't add anything that's not already around. And we're allowed to use electrons if we do this, because this is all this is we really only use this process in redox reactions. And if we have the redox reaction separated into reduction and oxidation then we actually do know that there are electrons changing hands, right? Which means, and we're gonna have electrons as a reactant in one of these two and as a product in the other one. How do we balance this in terms of the same process? How can, can we balance the atoms 
on its own for this bottom half reaction. Boom. Atoms are all good. Charges aren't though, right? What do we have to do to balance the charges? Two electrons to the left side. Right. You think back real quick to those oxidation states that were there on the, the reaction when we first figured out what was the oxidation, what was the reduction. We had manganese going from a plus seven to a plus two, right? How many electrons does that take? Five electrons to go from a plus seven to a plus two. We have two carbons, each going from a plus three to a plus four. That's going to give up two electrons. So to get our overall balanced reaction now, now that we have our two half reactions balanced, we just add them together. Once we have these both balanced, they're like algebra equations. Anything we, you know, as long as we keep them and treat both sides equally, we can do whatever we want to these reactions. So we can actually just take both of these and add them up and cancel out anything that shows up on both sides. So here's the last criteria for this one is, like I said, when we balance the reaction so far, electrons never show up on their own, right? This is not a plasma. We don't want free floating electrons. All of our electrons have to be bound to something. So how could we make it so that these two reactions add up in a way that all of our electrons cancel out? We have if we just added them up the way they are, we have these would go away and we still have three electron electrons on the left, right? What if we said this whole thing happened twice? That ah, I've never seen that before. If this whole thing happened twice, how many electrons are there? Six. Not not after you start canceling out. Be 10, right? How do we then make this one cancel out? If we have to use 10 electrons up here, we need 10 electrons to be produced from this other half reaction, right? Um, what Feels like cheating. Yeah. <laughs> Watch what we're gonna get at the end. We're gonna get a really complicated equation that's going to have everything balanced perfectly. No, that's normal. <laughs> so when we add these together, what are we going to get? Electrons are going to cancel out. We can actually do the distribution yeah. first before we add them up. Probably <laughs> so if we took this whole top one and multiplied everything by two, we are going to have 10 electrons, 16 hydrogens, Two for manganese, two manganese, two ions, and eight hydrogens, right? Still balanced because we distributed it across both sides, right? Just like an algebra equation, we just multiplied both sides of the algebra equation by two. Still equal on each side, right? And we can do the same exact thing down here. Five and five and 10. Clean that up. Yes, it is supposed to be 10 CO2. It's the problem of erasing them instead of just rewriting it underneath. We're going to get a monster combined equation when we do this, right? Compared to some of the ones we've done. But this method is foolproof because we just took something that wasn't balanced and we made it balanced. And then we added two things that were balanced together. And as long as both half reactions are balanced when we add them up, the result is also balanced. 
So 10 electrons is going to cancel out with 10 electrons, and then everything else you already have your coefficients for. So our combined reaction here is going to be 16 each pluses plus two permanganates plus five oxalates reacts to form two manganese two plus and two and eight H2O and 10 CO2. Was this on anyone's radar when I said, how are we gonna balance this? Like, there's no way you're gonna get here other than following this process, right? It's tricky. And it kind of has that memorizing the procedure, but it's still just balancing. You now know enough about chemistry though, that you're allowed to say, well, I need to add stuff to both sides. If you went through this process for a redox reaction that you could actually balance the regular way, um, what will happen is all of these extra plus H2O and plus H pluses and all those extra stuff that we added will wind up canceling out. And we wind up with it not showing up once we do that. But in this case, there was no way to balance it without adding extra hydrogens and oxygens. All right, so since I did that mostly verbally and was, we were, you were taking notes and answering questions the whole way, I also have a whole bunch of slides in the row that go through that same process, step-by-step step showing the work. But here's the overall method. Figure out your oxidation reaction and your reduction reaction or half reaction and write them separately. And then we're just going to balance those half reactions individually and then bring them back together at the end. So and when you do this, everything besides hydrogen and oxygen, you should be able to balance out on your own. If it's a, if it's a properly written half reaction, then you should be able to get everything except hydrogens and oxygens. Again, this is a bit of our, our water chauvinism in that we're assuming everything is happening in an aqueous environment. If we were on a different planet or in a different solvent, we wouldn't be adding water or something. We, if we were in ammonia, we'd be adding nitrogen to both sides. We'd be balancing it in terms of ammonia and then balancing the hydrogens the same way. Um, it'd be the same basic process. We just wouldn't base everything around H2O. Um, and, but there's the process of balance everything besides hydrogen and oxygen, and then you add balance your oxygens just by throwing water on one side. That throws off your hydrogens though, so then you balance your hydrogens by throwing H pluses to the other side. And then you balance the charge by adding electrons. Remember, when you're balancing the charge, you're not trying to get it to add up to zero. You're trying to make it so that both sides are the same. So whichever side of your half reaction has the higher charge, you're just going to add electrons to it until it matches the lower charge. It might be zero. It might not. But that's also going to help you understand the oxidation, the reduction part, right? If you know that it's the oxidation reaction, half reaction, you should be making electrons. Because you, whatever your compound is, is losing electrons, right, Leo? And if it's your reduction half reaction, you've got to be pumping electrons in because reduction is gaining electrons, GER. And then we just make it so that the electrons cancel out when we add everything up. So easy enough and it's easy for me to say. Um, it's definitely one of those things where, as long as I'm up here doing the example problems, it seems easy. Um, if I hand you a blank piece of paper and ask you to do this, it's a little bit hard to figure out where to start sometimes. So this is your, your cheat sheet, this slide here. Separate them, balance them individually, make the electrons cancel out. 
So, like I said, I'm going to fly through these because these are the same the same example we just did. And let's do some practice. Let's look at a bunch of half reactions and try and balance the half reactions. So, if it's a half reaction, you can have electrons left over. So this is before that last step of make the electrons cancel out. So for tin two, going to tin four, is that an oxidation or reduction? It's an oxidation. Step one, balance everything that's not oxygen and hydrogen. Done. Easy enough in this case, right? Step two, balance oxygens. Also already done, right? This is basically as simple as these can get because there are no nothing besides ox, um, besides tin. It's already balanced. The, what's the only thing that's not balanced here? Charge. charge. So we have to add electrons to balance the charge. Which side are we going to add the electrons to? The products. This is an oxidation, right? Oxidation is loss. Ox Leo, right? Losing electrons with oxidation. Tin is losing its electrons. So that means you have to have products that are electrons. How many? Boom, balanced tap reaction. We call this a half reaction because this can't happen without a corresponding reduction. The whole point of, that I spent bringing up plasmas earlier was that's the extreme case where you can have electrons just flying around. We're not going to have that on Earth under normal conditions. We can make some plasmas, but that's really neither here nor there. So it's a half reaction because this will always be paired with something else. If we're producing electrons when the tin's oxidized, something else has to be reduced to use up the electrons. And that's why we call it a half reaction. It's only part of the process. How about the second one? TiO2 and Ti plus two. This is titanium. What's the charge on the, on, uh, the titanium? Titanium's already balanced. It's a plus four here and it's going to a plus two. So we have an idea of what's happening. But we can't balance it like this. We have oxygens. So how do we balance the oxygens? Add two, Add two waters to the product side. Well, now our oxygens are balanced, but our hydrogens are. Now our oxygens are, our titaniums are balanced, our oxygens are balanced, and our hydrogens are balanced, but our charges aren't. So where do we have to put electrons? We've got a total charge of plus four on the left and a total charge of plus two on the right. If we added two electrons over here, that makes this side add up to zero, but we needed to add a plus four, so that doesn't work. So we don't need it to add up to zero, we need the two sides to be the same. So if you've got a plus two and a plus four, you've got to add electrons to the plus four side. And there's got to have two of them. The hydrogen being diatomic, why would we add two H cubes? Um, because hydrogen is not diatomic in, in, in an aqueous environment. In an aqueous environment, hydrogen um, is a plus one oxidation state because it's not very electronegative. It's really hydronium, right? So it's really, it's really hydronium, but that just winds up being extra writing. Yeah. And this, is, this is the common way of, of writing hydronium. It's just H plus aqueous with the understanding that really is hydronium. So if you took titanium four oxide and tin two, 
and you put them together, if we took these two half reactions, if we put them together, we have an oxidation and a reduction happening. So the, the sum of these two reactions would be a balanced redox reaction. So this is the other reason why we separate them into half reactions, because just like your book has a big table of delta H formation values and Ka values, your book has a big table of half reactions. They're all written as reductions. But if you want, if you have a reduction and half reaction and you want to get oxidation, you just flip it around, flop your uh, products and reactants around. And if you do a scalar, you just multiply yeah, by you the scalar. scalar. You just multiply by the scalar. So if we wanted to see what would happen with the balanced reaction of tin 2 and titanium 4 oxide would be, we just add these two together. Electrons cancel out. We would get four H pluses plus two tin, or sorry, plus tin two plus titanium four oxide reacts to form titanium two and tin four and water. So by having, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred reduction half reactions in the back of your book, basically have you have several thousand, if not tens of thousands, of possible combinations of redox reactions that you can represent with those. Right? If you can take the half any half reaction and add it to any other half reaction, you can make you can write your own redox reactions. All right. Before we take a break, let's do a couple more. First off, oxidation and reduction. I'm going to clear the ink here so it's a little cleaner. For this third one, reduction, we've got chlorine as a plus five going to chloride with a, plus, with a minus one charge. So that's useful because it means if we do everything right, for a reduction, we should be putting electrons on the reactant side. Right, because reduction is gain. I keep saying that, but um, the other the other memnonic besides Leo says Ger is oil rig. <clears throat> Oxidation is lost, reduction is gained. You know that what we're talking about is electrons. Um, then that is an even faster way of remembering it. So if chlorine is going to be reduced, it means that we have to have electrons as a reactant. So just keep that's a good thing to just keep in the back of our mind when we balance this. If we wind up, if we think it's a reduction, but we get electrons as a product, then either we were wrong when we did our oxidation states or we balanced it wrong. We were wrong somewhere. Our charges already look balanced, our chlorides look balanced, but our oxygens aren't. So what do we do? That throws off our hydrogens, which weren't an issue, we didn't think, but now they are. And now our charges aren't balanced anymore, but we know what to do with that. Six electrons and six H pluses will cancel out, so we'll get a minus one and a minus one. So overall, everything balances that way, which again, makes sense because our oxidation state was going from a plus five to a minus one. That's a change of six, right? If our oxidation state is going from plus five to minus one, we need six electrons to do it. Hence, six electrons. Again, the charges will take care of themselves if you pay attention, but it's kind of satisfying to see, okay, I predicted it was a, that we were plus five to a minus one, and indeed we get six electrons showing us. One more, one more way to check your work. And because again, if you predict the oxidation state is changing by six and you don't get six electrons, you messed up somewhere. 
Last but not least, let's do nitrogen and ammonia. So this is one of the processes involved in, in nitrogen fixation, right? N2 is really stable as a gas, which is why it's 80% of our atmosphere and we don't even notice it. But if you want to take N2 as a gas and turn it into ammonia, if you are one of those crazy nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in legumes, on the roots of legumes, root nodules of legumes, I'm remembering my botany properly. Um, what do we have to do to balance this? First off, I guess oxidation or reduction? Reduction. Going from zero, and it's got to be a minus three for this to work out, right? So reduction. Again, we should see electrons on the reactant side. Start by balancing everything that's not hydrogen or oxygen. So in this case, our nitrogens. You just need a two there. All right, our nitrogens are balanced. We don't have any oxygen, which means our oxygens are balanced, right? So we don't need to add any waters, but we do have hydrogens. So we balance the hydrogens with the H pluses. We've got a total of eight on the right hand side. So we've got like eight, eight plus H pluses over here. And what do we do for the electrons now? Got a net charge of plus two on this side, and a net charge currently is plus eight. So plus six electrons. Which again, we went from zero to minus three, but we did it twice, which is why six electrons makes sense. If we took this, these are both reductions, right? If we wanted to see how these would interact with each other, we'd just take one of them and flip it so it was an oxidation. And then we could add them up and the electrons would cancel out. Whether or not that's a spontaneous process, we'll find out, we'll learn how to tell um, based on those tables of half reactions, they also have what's called a cell potential, or sorry, standard reduction potential associated with them. So just like with delta G's, figuring out if a reaction was um, spontaneous, we just added everything up and found your overall delta G, right? If delta G was negative, the reaction was spontaneous. With these half reactions, this will do the same exact thing, except instead of looking for delta G, we'll look for voltages. Turns out voltages are tied to delta G, just like K is tied to delta G. Turns out everything is connected at this point when we start talking about thermodynamics. Um, electrochemistry and voltages is just another way of looking at equilibrium constants, which is just another way of looking at delta G. They're all the same. It's just different fields found it in different orders and at different times. And they didn't know that they were all connected until later. All right, let's take a break. Um, and let's come back at five after. And if you're back at, call it two after, then you get to listen to them. They might be giants. I try to like read them. the problem. Yeah, I also want to test it. That would be nice. Because it kind of shows your brain. Well, I think for that one, the last one, it tells you exactly how to do it. Yeah. So, it's a really weird. It's 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 really weird. It
Yeah, I just use the email. Let's do it. I think you have to plug it to wrong answers. It kind of makes sense reading through it, but I didn't really understand it. It the last physics example. Oh uh, my yeah, for the first part. For the first homework. Yeah. Yeah. Did you also just like just, just use the solution? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they're not gonna ask that. It's the problem. Yeah. You like. That would do a do a windows like two thousand. Yeah. 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 I mean, I like I don't mind necessarily like being exposed to like the problems as long as they don't show up on like tests. On exams, yeah. yeah. If it's like on a group thing, you'll be uh, yeah, I think it'll snap. I mean, but it is nice to see it's nice to see like how far how, how far you can push an equation mm -hmm. and like uh, um, how com how many variables you can like like limit and and uh, solve for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you push. Exactly, that. it's pushing. Yeah, it's pushing. Push, push the most. Now. Yeah, it's like, especially with like the speed that these classes go at, and yeah. be able to having yeah. yeah, to be able to like work really problem solve too far. Well, there's so much to go. Like you have to know how to derive the different moments equations. Yeah. Oh, you just you practice those. So yeah, you'll be all right. It's the one in your problem. So the MI time to see whatever. Hopefully, I wonder if we can convince her to like give yeah, us which part are you at? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, for the tables, I got everything except for the um, yeah. we'll have the, the actual answer for moments. Yeah, that's only mm -hmm. we'll have a sheet. Yeah, okay. Like you can see the editing. Yeah, yeah. But this How is uh. I did all these, but this is what she what she wrote down, for mm -hmm. it. and our answers came out to be pretty close to everyone else's. Uh, awesome. And in, in this stage, it's this is like a condensed version. There's another step here where you turn it. Did you finish a lot of time? No. Turn the milliliters into liters. So you can multiply by a thousand. That's it. Oh. So you would like do the ratio. Are you getting that because they're really well? This is you're taking the multiple HCL that you get and dividing with the good ratio of HCL. How about you know what Still hella cute. Uh, this will be happening here. Like the front page, no, I'm gonna get drift and stuff. Oh, right. Um, that's from the equation that it's in the uh, the actual thing. Uh, yeah, the Now that we're not not showing you copyright material, it'd be you'd be amazed how fast. Does anybody in here upload videos to YouTube? YouTube catches copyright violations like that. One time I did this, I did show the same song like thirty seconds of it, and I tried to upload the video, the recording to YouTube, and it wouldn't let me hit publish because it scanned through, found the copyrighted material, and said. No, you can't release this for free unless you make people watch an ad and give the royalties to the copyright holders, and which was weird to me. I was not expecting that at all. Um, but anyway, excuse me. All right, so we're coming back and talking about the, this is the next few slides are the process of adding the reactions together. 
Um, and so just like we talked about before, if we have two different half reactions, one oxidation and one reduction, if we want to look at, at how the reaction would be totally balanced when we put them together, we just need the electrons to cancel out. So in this case, once we do that, um, to do that, we need to have the same number of electrons being produced as being used, which makes sense from a conservation of mass point of view, right? You can't use electrons that you don't have. And if you produce electrons through an oxidation, they have to go somewhere. And so the way we do that is just by multiplying both sides so that you get the lowest common multiple of electrons and you can wind up with them canceling out to get an overall reaction that looks like this. Ten electrons, sixteen lead pluses, two permanganates, five oxalates turns to two manganese, two plus, eight waters, ten CO twos, and ten electrons. The only thing that shows up on both sides is the electrons, so we can cancel them out. The other advantage to doing this all in, or treating it like it's all happening in water, um, means that we, because we're balancing hydrogens and oxygens with the same the same stuff with hydrogens and, and hydroni or H pluses. Um, a lot of times we'll frequently wind up with water showing up on both sides once we add them together, in which case you just cancel them out. If you have eight, elect eight waters being produced and five waters being used, just cross out the smaller number. Just cancel out as many of them as you can. Just like you would if you were combining like terms in an algebra expression. And so then there's our balanced, our final balanced reaction right here. So let's let's do another one. Runs back. Start by defining your half reactions. Balance the half reactions. Make the electrons cancel out and add them up. to backwards, at least for me. So chromium going to from plus six has to be plus six because of seven times minus two, that's minus 14. We need the overall charge from the dichromate to be a minus two. So we need our, our chromiums to add up to 12. And there's two of them, so each of them must be plus six. This is a slightly simplified way of looking at oxidation state because it's assuming both chromiums have the same oxidation state, which is a decent assumption in inorganic chemistry. When we get to organic chemistry, we'll find out that one carbon can have an oxidation state of plus two, and it can be next to another carbon that has an oxidation state of minus two in the same molecule. But for now, we can make the make that assumption. It's a valid assumption for now. And then it's going to plus three. So the chromiums are going from plus six to plus three, which makes the, the oxidation or reduction? Reduction. So... There's our reduction. Mm -hmm. 
Obviously, this isn't going to be enough room to write the balanced version, but I'm just writing them out separately as our separate half reactions before we actually go through the, the balancing. That's the easy one, right? And then just like with chlorine and chlorine, we have three oxides that are all minus two. So iodine has to be plus five. It's not plus six because we needed to add up to the negative one charge for the whole mole or the Y. So there's our oxidation going from minus one to plus five. Minus one actually went the right spot. So now that we have our two half reactions, we've done a bunch of practices of these. It's still, we did take a break in the middle there. So um, might take a little bit of remembering. And I'm actually going to clean this up. Typically, the best way to do this is just put your reaction arrow square in the middle of the page and leave yourself plenty of room on the right and left to add stuff in um, as far as keeping things organized on a piece of paper. So iodines are balanced. We're good there, right? Oxygen and water. So we need to do what? Add water on the left and how many? So now hydrogens with H pluses and now electrons, which side and how many? You got an overall charge of plus of minus one on the reactant side and plus five over here. All right, so there's one of our balanced half reactions. Should look really familiar, right? Turns out chlorine reacting to form chloride is really, really similar to iodine reacting to form iodide. Funny thing about columns on the periodic table is that they tend to react in a similar way, right? And then how about our reduction? Start with our chromiums. Chromiums are good. Next, oxygens. Seven, so we need seven waters. Fourteen H pluses. And then Six electrons. Everything adds up to plus six on the right hand side. On this side, everything's currently adding up to plus 12. So we need to bring our plus 12 down to plus six with six electrons. Again, without this process, nobody would have ever gotten to these two half reactions, let alone where we're going once we add them up, right? Next thing is six electrons and six electrons. We don't need to mess with multiplying by a scalar. Not multiplying the coefficients by anything. We're just going to add them up. It's and, and cancels some of the H's and some of the waters too. Not entirely, but some of them cancel out. So when we come back and do that, so our six electrons are going to go away. 14 H pluses on one side and six on the other. 6H pluses go away, which means this turns to an E. And 
and then H2O is three waters here and seven there. So three H2O is going away, and this turns into four H2O. <laughs> I'm going to rewrite that a little bit lower. So eight H pluses plus iodine plus dichromate. React to form two chromium threes plus four waters plus iodine. So, is electrochemistry like this always happening, like you said, with the water chauvinism, but does it happen in just like our atmosphere where there isn't? If it does, then you don't get to just add things in there willy nilly. But if it, it also is one of the reasons why rusting on on metal happens more when there's water molecules around in high humidity environments or in when things have been rained on. Um, they tend to rust faster because that allows us some of these reactions where water molecules might have been the limiting reactant before. It allows some of those reactions to happen. You need something present as a source of H pluses or to mediate some of these other things. Um, but a lot of times, if it was, if we were doing this was a class on atmospheric chemistry, we wouldn't be doing this with water and H pluses. We might be doing it with oxygen gas instead. Um, so there are other ways. This is where we're headed with this is we can actually take these half reactions and use them to make batteries. Batteries are called galvanic cells. Um, basically, if you separate your two half reactions physically, you have your two half reactions set up in two different locations, but so you connect them with a wire that allows electrons to move from one side to the other from your oxidation cell, from your oxidation reaction to your reduction reaction, you can generate current because the oxidation is trying to happen and push electrons through the wire over to the reduction reaction that needs the electrons. So that's all a battery really is, is two half reactions that are happening simultaneously, just like this, separated by a physical distance and a, and a conductor that allows electrons to pass, which is kind of cool. That's actually gonna be next week's lab. We're gonna make some galvanic cells in lab we take a solution of zinc, metal, and copper ions, we can get these reactions to form, or these uh, reactions to happen. All right. So there's another reaction here, but I want to get to one more aspect of this. And this kind of ties into your question, Laurelyn, about what happens if we don't have some of these around, but instead of going all the way to what if we don't have any water, if it's not aqueous, this still relies on the reaction being happening in a acidic environment, right? We can still have an, an aqueous solution, but not be acidic. What if it's a basic solution? If it's a basic solution, we don't have any H pluses. And so we basically, we cancel out. Now that this is balanced, we don't really want to change anything on one side without changing the other side. But effectively, if it's happening in a basic solution, we just add enough hydroxides to both sides so that all of your hydroniums cancel out, all of your H pluses cancel out. So I'm going to help me remember if I don't get the numbers right. I'm gonna rewrite this up here. H plus plus dichromate plus iodide, right? Goes to four waters plus CR, three plus two of them, and iodate. If this is the reaction, the balanced reaction, if it's happening in the acidic environment, if it's in a basic environment, we just add OH minuses, both sides. 
So if we want to add enough hydroxides to fully cancel those out, we just add eight of them. You have eight hydroxides and eight H pluses. What does that add up to? What do they react to form? Eight waters. And on this side, we don't have anything to cancel out the eight hydroxides, so they just say it's hydroxides. It's still balanced at this point, though, right? Because we added eight hydroxides to both sides. Do the same thing to each side, still balanced. Last thing we want to do, though, is we have water now. Now, once again, we have water as a reactant and water as a product. So we just simplify it again, just like we did before. Cancel out that water, cancel out the eight, and turn it into a four. So if it's under in basic conditions, we actually would see 4H2O plus Cr2O7 plus iodide form eight hydroxides plus two chromiums plus IO3 minus. And so that if we were in more extreme conditions, like we were just talking about, if there was no water, if this was happening in just purely in a gas phase, um, then we would do something similar. Instead of just saying, oh, we don't have H pluses, we actually have hydroxides, we would do something like, okay, well, we don't actually have waters, we have O2 molecules or something like that. But we'd still use the same basic process where we basically add what's around to the products and the reactants of your half reaction to make the reaction balanced. And once you get it balanced with the electrons, you add your two half reactions together. And so, in the way that you know whether to do this, acidic solutions in general are way more common, both in everyday life and in lab. Um, acids are just more common on the planet Earth based on the distribution of elements um, that naturally occur here. So, Unless you're told otherwise, assume that these reactions are happening in an aqueous environment, it's acidic, at least slightly acidic. If it specifically says, balance the reaction as though it was happening under basic conditions, you do the same thing, then you just add this extra step at the end where you cancel out any H pluses. If there's no H pluses that showed up when you balance things, it doesn't matter whether it's acidic or basic. Our blood is basic. Right? What's that? Our blood. Our blood is very slightly basic. Yeah. The water is very slightly acidic. Typically, drinking water is slightly acidic. Our blood is slightly basic mostly because it's buffered at a pH between 7.2 and 7.6, or is it 7.4 and 7.8? 7.3, 7.4. Okay, so, but that's in the lungs, slightly more acidic. No, that must be at the extremities. Uh, in your lungs, it's slightly more basic. In your extremities, it's slightly more acidic because of the extra CO2 that's present at your extremities, because your body's using the oxygen and producing CO2. CO2 dissolved in water makes carbonic acid. Um, why is that relevant? Well, it turns out that the binding affinity for hemoglobin to oxygen is pH dependent. And when, when the hemoglobin gets to a slightly more acidic environment, it drops the binding affinity of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin can't hold on to the oxygen as tightly once it's in an acidic environment. So what's going to happen when if you have a bunch of hemoglobin carrying oxygen and then it hits an acidic environment, what happens? It lets go of it, right? Which is actually a perfect delivery system. Your hemoglobin is actually works, it's evolved really, really well so that it lowers its binding affinity when it gets to the area that, of your body that has the most CO2, which is usually also where you need the oxygen the most. Those are the muscles that are working the hardest at that time. And you don't want your hemoglobin to hold on to oxygen really well because then it would never deliver oxygen anywhere, right? You know, think of a mailman that got emotionally attached to the packages he was delivering, right? We don't want that to happen. We want something to be able to pick it up, hold it on well enough that it gets to where it's going, where it's needed, and then it lets go. It turns out the pH of your blood is dependent on CO2, and that's a really, really valuable tool 
for our bodies in terms of this, being able to let go of the hemoglobin. Really neither here nor there, but really interesting. I remember how I said we spent two weeks learning just about hemoglobin in my biochem class. That was one of the aspects of it. Um, also, it turns out this is relevant to us. Um, it takes it only takes a couple of days for your body to initially adjust to being at altitude, um, and a couple months to be feel in shape at altitude, right? But your body doesn't truly adjust to altitude until three to five years at altitude. After three to five years, your body makes enough of this molecule called is it a one three BPG or one or two three BPG. Um, that actually binds into the middle of all your hemoglobin molecules. Hemoglobin is made up of four subunits that kind of fit together in this general ball shape. And each one of them can hold an oxygen, two of them, four can hold an oxygen. Um, and then the middle, if there's enough 2, 3 BPG, it changes the shape of them just barely. But it, again, it changes the binding affinity of oxygen and hemoglobin such that it accounts for the fact that we actually have about 20% less oxygen at altitude. But that doesn't happen until three to four years after you've started living at altitude. So once you've lived at altitude three to four years, and then you're fully adapted and will be for a long period of time. That's super saiyan. Exactly. <laughs> That's how you get your final form. Or do you lose it if you go back? Just for an extended period of time, but again, three to five years. It's an ongoing equilibrium process. It takes three to five years to reach equilibrium. And so we move away. Is there a catalyst to speed up that process? I'll probably exercise. The more you're using your hemoglobin, the more your body is going to start adjusting the hemoglobin to work better. How does diamonds work? How does what? Diamonds work. I have no idea. Um, I've never heard of that, so I don't know. Um, ask me again. Ask me on a quiz question, and I'll look it up and we'll talk about it. That's good. All right. So here's the slide on, this is what you do to neutralize the H pluses, right? So just the same thing we just worked through. If it's in basic conditions, balance it like normal, and then cancel out your H pluses by adding hydroxides to both sides. And then if that means that you have extra waters on both sides again, cancel them out again. So let's do this like it's in acidic solution first, and then we'll go through and say, but if it was basic, here's what it would look like. I'm going to do it silently up here so everybody can try and do it on your own. I'm going to try to do it silently. It's hard for me.
Everybody following me up through the half reactions? The electrons easily cancel out because we have four and five electrons. So the lowest common multiple of four and five is 20, right? But that will at least take care of our electrons. And we're going to get. Thirty-two H pluses plus four permanganates plus five waters plus five methanols reacts to form four MNO plus MN two plus, excuse me. And sixteen waters. Five formaldehydes. And twenty H pluses. You said leave yourself lots of room on these ones, especially once you start adding them together before you start canceling stuff out. And this is one that unless I distributed the four and rewrote it out, each of the half reactions out separately, um, I wouldn't try to start canceling out H pluses and H2Os yeah. individually. It's just too easy to make a dumb arithmetic mistake if you do that. So even though it's a lot more writing, it takes up more space, do it like this, and then you can start crossing stuff off. Like, 20 H pluses and 32 H pluses. So that can go away. And this can change to 12 H pluses. For manganates, can't do anything with waters we can. Five waters cancel out. So we're going to get 11. Waters. On the product side. Which simplifies things a little bit, but again, not like we were ever getting here from there without this process. That's why we had to learn this process and why we don't, I don't want to say, I, I don't mean why we don't ask questions about why we're adding waters, but just understand that the assumption is most of these reactions are happening in an aqueous environment. So that's why we're allowed to add the H2Os and H pluses willy nilly. You forgot to put a five. Did I miss a five? On the stage four. Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. So not exactly elegant necessarily. It's sort of a brute force solution, but it works every time. So it's universal. As long as we're in an acidic environment, this is how these two redox reactions are going to work together. This is how this combined reaction is going to work together. All right, does everybody have the, the net reaction written down? 
Yes. Are we feeling okay? They wrote it out as H single to an H. So because just for the sake of counting atoms and balancing hydrogens, um, I combined these. This is a better way of writing these two organic compounds. Um, but it makes it hard. It's better in the sense that it tells you what the structure is more. Um, but it's hard, it makes it harder to balance it if you don't have all your hydrogens grouped together. So for the sake of, since this is a balancing problem, I recombine the hydrogens all together for these. Um, this is still methanol. It's just harder to tell what the actual organic structure looks like when you write it in this condensed form. Uh, but it's the same same molecule. I canceled them out because there were twelve. There were thirty two on the. Oh yes, I can use myself for that as well. I differentiate between your twelve and your O's, right? When in doubt, and put a hash mark for your for your O. So you know that that's an, um, a zero versus an oxygen. So let's do one in a basic solution. We're just going to power through some practice with these until you've got that process down. <laughs> This is a little bit different. It's not permanganate going to Mn2 plus, it's permanganate going to manganese 4 oxide. So the balancing will be a little bit different. It's not the same half reaction we've already seen twice, barely. But we still have permanganate, so that's a plus seven going to plus four. So that's our reduction. We see this a lot because permanganate is a really common oxidizing agent because it reduces so easily. We see permanganate turning into manganese a lot, manganese ions. Um, and so it's that's a pretty common one to wind up using in these reactions. And then like we had before, <laughs> We've seen iodine turning into iodate. We've seen chloride turning into chlorate. So here we have bromide turning into bromate. Turns that you memorized the, all of the chlorates, right? For chlorate, chlorate, chloride, hypochlorite. Turns out that there's a bromine equivalent and an iodine equivalent of all four of those as well. We just didn't have you memorized because why? Once you know that how the chlorides work. <laughs> With an extra syllable in there. And really, frankly, if you can see, if it's something like this where there's two reactants and two products, you don't even really need to decide ahead of time what's the oxidation and what's the reduction. It can be helpful in the case where you have something, some elements that are not being oxidized or reduced. You have a reaction where there are some neither oxidized nor reduced. It's helpful for figuring out what goes with what half reaction sometimes. But it's not really necessary to write reduced and oxidized before we start. If we do our half reaction method properly, it'll tell us where the electrons are coming from and where they're being used. Ramping up speed a little bit, especially on the ones that look really similar to ones we've already done a few times. <laughs> but if you want me to slow down at any point, just let me know.
cups? Did you get five? Didn't I? Okay. For some reason, I wasn't adding up the charges right in my head. I thought it made me safe. So then we've got six electrons in the oxidation at, up top, three electrons here. That's a little bit nicer than four and five, at least, right? We're going to need to distribute the two so that we can get six electrons. This is the way that I would do it. If I was going to try and cancel stuff out before I was going to add things together to save a little bit of writing, it doesn't really save you any writing because basically my advice is distribute the two and rewrite it with the two distributed. And then, because then you can, when you add it up, at least you're not trying to do multiplication and canceling things out at the same time. But now that we've got our number of electrons, Even, we know electrons are going to cancel out. Got three H2O here and four H2O here. So those gold um, are going to simplify. And then we've got six H pluses and eight H pluses. Now we can just write everything out, right? 2H pluses plus two permanganates plus bromide allows or makes bromate plus two manganese four oxide plus nothing. That's it. Is it one water? Yeah, there's yeah, there's one water in each two. Oh, oh that means that's the problem doing that. Y'all are already catching my mistakes. There's nothing to it. It's just a process. This is actually one of the simpler things in, in chemistry and learning because there's not really any problem solving involved in it, right? If you can do oxidation states and you can memorize some steps, then that's all you have to do, really. There's not a whole lot of critical thought involved. You can use the critical thought to check your answers. And I would recommend doing that so that you reinforce how what's actually happening in these. Like, oh, I produced electrons here. This is the oxidation. I used electrons. This is the reduction. Reminding yourself of those concepts as you do this is a good idea but it's not necessary by any stretch. And definitely don't think yourself into a corner or overthink it on a test where you wind up you know, convincing yourself you balanced it wrong because you mixed up oxidized and reduced in your head at the beginning. Um, get the process down, trust the process. All right, Embiid. What's that? I said, all right, Embiid. Okay. <laughs> All right, I've got more practice here, but I don't know, we're not going to have time to work through one of these in uh, two minutes. Oh, under basic solution. Sorry, good point. Last thought. It said in basic solution. I should have remembered to cancel off these two H pluses. Add two hydroxides to both sides. Cancel off the waters you get. And so really you wind up with two waters on this side and plus two OH minuses over here, cancel out water, you get a water on the side. Right, so 
Thank you. Thank you, quiz this weekend. Nothing on the research project to turn in this weekend. To just be working on that checklist, get uh, get things firmed up uh, with your group, and then um, yeah, the quiz is just going to be a couple of these, some practice, maybe some oxidation states. I know it's very good. Let's just say very sure you talk very quickly. Um, you know, or talk to me. We'll start a list. Oh, so it's good.